to join us and sing. I noticed that I think it was Bob back there that couldn't help but sing. It was yeah, uh, turning on him, so uh, thank you for that. Well, we're going to transition to this microphone, and uh, we're going to uh, look at our scripture for today. This is basically the text, but we're going to come back and look at some other, um, to put and look at it in context. Let's just look at this together. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We're fighting a war. There's a war going on in America. But it's not a war we're going to win by getting guns and going and shooting people. Hopefully it won't come to that. This war is a war in the spiritual realm. We're fighting a major battle in the spiritual realm. The enemy that the Christian warriors fight against are demonic principalities. Principal or chief demons and rulers. They're also demonic authorities. Demons who have been delegated authority by the top ranking demons or by Lucifer himself and the demonic rulers of the darkness of this age, which are regional demonic rulers that rule in certain areas of the world. And then the demonic host of wickedness in the heavenly places, which include false teachers who endeavor to corrupt Christianity. Now, the Bible says that's no wonder. They're, for such are false ap apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no wonder for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. And so we've got a battle going on and it's a spiritual battle. The Bible tells us be strong in the Lord. Now, did you notice it says be strong, not be weak? It doesn't say be wimps. Do you see wimp up there? No, it doesn't say be wimps. It says be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles and the tricks of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We're back to our text. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your waist girt with truth, girded with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the enemy or the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, remember we've been talking about some of these things. We've talked about the helmet. We've talked about the breastplate of righteousness. We've talked about the belt of truth. Now we're down to the sword, the sword of the Spirit. We'll pick up some of the others later, but... The sword of the Spirit, and I want, to, I want us to address that today. You see, the Christian warrior has a sword. And a sword is both, both an offensive and defensive weapon. The shield is more defensive. You try to block the attacks of the, of the enemy. And uh, some of the other, the helmet is to withstand the blows that are coming. You don't go headbutt them with a helmet. Well, you could, I guess, but that's not the normal way you do with the... With the Helmets. Helmets are to protect you from the flying darts that are coming against you. The sword is both offensive and defensive. You can use the sword to parry the thrust of the enemy, and you can also use the sword to go in for the killing blow against the enemy. So the sword is a defensive and offensive weapon, and the Christian's warrior sword is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But that's a captive G, not just any God. The word of the Lord God, Jehovah God. Amen. Now, I want us to look at that a little bit and go into a little deeper digging into it to see some of what's behind it. The phrase, the word of the Lord, is found 5,382 times <laughs> in the Bible. That makes it pretty prominent and, fairly, and very important. 
5,380 times. That phrase is found in the Word of God. The Word of the Lord. And it says the Word of the Lord came. The Word of the Lord spoke. The Word of the Lord was heard. Many times that phrase is used. Now, God gave this name for God to Moses in the book of Exodus as he was calling Moses to lead the children of Israel out of the bondage of Egypt into the land of promise. And here's what, uh, what, what it says. Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, Say, I am who I am has sent you. And uh, he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. He's not the I was. God is never the I was. He's not a has been. God is never the I will be. Now he will be, but he and he was, but he's not the past tense or the present. He's in the present tense. He's not the future past. Present tense, I am. I am the Lord, he said. And he, he, he can't say, well, I was, but now I'm getting kind of old and feeble, like maybe some of us are doing. No, he says, I am the Lord. I am who I am. I'm the self-existing one. I exist because I exist in myself. Now, every one of us here exists because someone else existed before us and gave birth to us and we were born. The human race is here because the Creator created the human race. God had no Creator. He always is. He always is the I Am. But there's another meaning to that word, to that name. And God revealed it in Exodus chapter 6, verses 2 to 3, when He said, God said to Moses, I am the Lord. Now notice those that word Lord, all the letters are capitalized, right? I want you to keep noticing that, and, the, and, and we'll explain it in a moment. But that word is really the name for God that God gave Moses. And the, some people pronounce it Yahweh, some people call it Jehovah or Yehovah. And uh, that's really because the word, word is actually Y-H-W-H. There are no vowels in it. So how, how do you pronounce a word without any vowels? They, kind of put the vowels in there so it can become pronounceable. And so he said, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by the name God Almighty. And I think it's in Genesis chapter 12 where the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, I am El Shaddai. I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be perfect. And, and so he said, that's the name that they knew me by. I, I introduced myself to them as El Shaddai. But by my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them? Now I'm introducing myself to you, to the children of Israel, as with my new name, Yehovah, or Jehovah, or Yahweh, however you want to pronounce it, because basically uh, we're, we're making a word up that we can pronounce because there was no pronunciation really that we could figure out with just five, four consonants. But notice, later when God gave the command, the Ten Commandments, he said, you shall not take the name of the, notice those capital letters? The Lord. Now that's really, he's saying, you shall not take the name of Jehovah, your God in vain. For Jehovah will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now you can take Allah's name in vain because he is no God. You can take Buddha's name because he is no God. You can take all those uh, those Brahma bulls in India. And the, you can say all you want to say about them. They're no gods. But if you mention Jehovah's name, you better speak in reverence and honor for God, the Lord God, because that is the holy name of God. And he said, don't take that name in vain. Don't misuse or abuse that name. Don't use it lightly. Because if you do, Jehovah will hold you accountable if you take his name in vain. Now, let's go on. This name for God was considered so holy by the children of Israel that they used the, the word Adonai, which means master, instead of the holy name for God. They were afraid that they might slip up and abuse or misuse the name. So instead of using the name Yahweh or Yehovah, they would say Adonai, which means the master. But really, they use that in the place of calling His name. 
And the translators of the Old Testament, following along with that same reverence for the name of, of Jehovah, they decided that when they would come to that word, they would put Lord in all capitals. So when you see the word Lord, all capitals, that's the name. That's the holy name of God that he gave to Moses to pass on to the children of Israel. And all the places, almost all the places where the name Jehovah is found in the scriptures, you'll find this name, L-O-R-D, all in caps. So you got it? Let's move forward. God sent an angel to the Virgin Mary and told her. What did he say? Do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Now, Jesus is the word we use. Uh, but Yehoshua would be the Hebrew word. And it really means Jehovah is salvation. So Jesus' name is connected to the holy name of God in the Old Testament that he gave to Moses. And his name, every time his name is spoken, it is basically saying, Jehovah is salvation. And he came to us in Jesus Christ. Are you getting that? So the holy name of God in the Old Testament is transferred over to us in the name of Jesus, or the name Yeshua, which is Jehovah is salvation. And he's, she, God went on to tell her, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, what? When is it going to end? 1990? Oh, uh, 2016. No. Forever. There will be no end. Jesus Christ is Lord forever. Jesus Christ is King of Kings forever. Jesus Christ, there will never be an end to the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Regardless of what the world does, the United Nations, those trying to build a one world government, whatever they do, they will not succeed at taking down Jesus Christ because of His kingdom there will be no end. Now, we see, we go back, we're talking about the Word of the Lord. And, and in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him and without Him nothing was made that was made in Him was life. And the life was the light of men. And then you go down to verse 14 of John, of, of John chapter 1. And the Word became flesh. The living eternal Word, Jehovah, became human and came to us in Jesus Christ as a human being. That's what we call the incarnation, where God became flesh, carne for flesh. God became human. And we beheld His glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Remember, the Word is not just something that's written or spoken, but it is the One who is the Creator and came to us in the person of Jesus Christ in the, in, with the name Jesus, or Yehoshua, Jehovah's salvation. And again, Notice this, the word of the Lord is found 5,382 times in the scriptures. This is important. The word of the Lord is the written words of Jehovah. It's also the spoken words of Jehovah and the living word of Jehovah who's come to us in human flesh, Yehoshua or Jesus Christ. Now, the sword of the spirit is what? The word. The most powerful defensive and offensive weapon we have is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of the Lord. Amen. The spoken Word, the written Word that we speak, and He Himself, who is the Word, who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Lo, I am with you always. Amen. We've got a powerful sword, folks. We've got a powerful weapon. But I want you to notice something. And you probably, most of you probably know this, but Jesus himself used the written word in his battle with Satan. It's interesting, after he was baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist, that the Bible says Jesus was led up 
by the Spirit to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Isn't that kind of weird? I mean, God says, okay, you go up there and get tempted. You suppose he tells any of us to do that? Well, I suppose we, we can pray that prayer lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And we'd rather not go into temptation. He does deliver us from evil, but many times in the temptation. And Jesus was led by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was hungry, then the tempter came to him. When he wasn't hungry, the tempter didn't really have much to say to him about turning rocks into bread because that, that wouldn't be something you'd be interested in. But if you're really hungry and really starving and you're looking for something to eat, well, that, that might be a temptation. And so G he comes to Jesus and he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now, if you are the Son of God, is basically saying, prove yourself. Use your power to satisfy your need. You're hungry? Just declare stones are now bread and eat them. Use your power for your own personal interest, your own personal satisfaction, to satisfy your own personal hunger and need. And Jesus came back at him with the scripture. He answered and said, it is written. Now this is a lesson for all of us. And if you don't study your Bible, you're not going to know how to use your Bible. When you study your Bible and you have the scriptures inside of you, then when the tempter comes and the, 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 the attack comes, you can pull out one of those Bible verses and say, this is what God says. And he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, where was that written? I've done your homework for you. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3 is what Jesus was quoting. And here's the verse that he was quoting from. So God is talking through Moses. He says, So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know. You, he, he was trying to teach you this lesson, that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by the word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. You got that? So Jesus pulls this right out of Deuteronomy. In fact, as you'll notice here in a minute, every one of the verses he uses comes from Deuteronomy. Some of the writings of, of Moses. So here's the next one. This time the devil quotes scripture. <clears throat> you think he doesn't know some scripture? He probably cannot quote most of us. So when you pull up the scripture, he's, yeah, that's there. I, I know that. God said that. I, I remember knowing that. And he knows it when you hit him with it. The devil came up with one from Psalm 91. Anybody love Psalm 91? Oh, it's one of my favorite passages. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God, and Him will I trust. But he pulls up verse 11 and he misquotes it. He leaves out a part of it. He says, if you're the Son of God, prove it. Throw yourself down from the tall pinnacle of the, of the temple. And uh, God says, it's written. He'll give his angels charge over you. And in your hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Now you go back and do some more homework and you can see the full context of what that says. But he left out some of the words. And it's like, okay, you, you want scripture? I'll tell you the scripture. You can go ahead and jump off because God said he won't let you fall. And Jesus comes back and said, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now, here he is, Jesus is quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. And it says, You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him at Massah. And uh, so he hits him back with the scripture. No, that's tempting God. You see, there's a passage of scripture that said, and this is in the last chapter of Mark where he said that he who believes on me, these signs shall follow those that believe. Uh, they shall pick up serpent, serpents and uh, they won't be hurt by them. Now he didn't say go looking for a serpent to try that out. There are people that do that. 
and they're being misguided and misled. I talked to one who sat beside me in, uh, on a flight one day, and he was telling me that he was a snake handler. He believed that that's the way they proved that they were people of faith was by picking up poisonous snakes. He said, occasionally some of us die because we don't have enough faith. But if, 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 he didn't say, he didn't say, go try it. Actually, that was fulfilled on the day that um, Paul the Apostle was shipwrecked on the island. And uh, when he was gathering sticks to put in the fire to build a fire so they could warm themselves, a snake came out of and bit him and was just latched on and hanging on, on, on his arm. And, and he just shook him off into the fire. And the people said, ah, oh, this guy, he's escaped the storm, but he must be a really wicked person because the gods have sent a snake to bite him. And he just shook it off into the fire. And then they watched to watch him collapse into the fire himself. And when he stood there and was unharmed, they said, Ah, huh, he's not a criminal. He must be a God himself. And God's promise was fulfilled in that passage and maybe some other time, other places. But Jesus said here, don't tempt the Lord your God. Don't jump off of a building saying, catch me now, Lord. Now, if the Lord tells you to jump, you better jump. But if he doesn't tell you to jump, you better stay with your feet planted on, on the firm ground. He's not asking us to tempt him. And Satan was saying, go ahead and tempt him. Show your power. You know what Satan was trying to do? He was trying to get Jesus to avoid going the way that he was going, to engage in a warfare that would destroy the devil. He wanted him to get out there and use the devil's methods to bond himself, to exalt himself, to promote himself. And Jesus said, no, no, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So the devil decided, well, we're going to try one more time. He takes him up on a high mountain so he can look out over the kingdoms of the earth and he shows him the kingdoms of the world and he says, you see all this, it's mine. And in another passage, he said, these are mine and mine to give to whomever I choose to give them to. Jesus didn't dispute that. Satan said, I'll give them to you. You can have them. You can be king of the world. I'll let you be king. Only you'll be king under me. Bow down and worship me as your God. And then you can be the king of the world. And Jesus came back with the scripture again. And he said, get behind me, Satan, or away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. So he used the written word, the spoken word. This is like he pulled out the sword and he just jabbed Satan with the word of God. And Satan backed off. Then the devil left him. And angels came and ministered to him. Jesus was quoted from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. And so he used the word of the Lord to drive home the sword when Satan came. And that's a quick lesson for us to learn how to use the sword of the Spirit, the word of the Lord. Because Satan's the enemy. He's attacked him. He's trying to attack. He wants to defeat. He wants to discourage. He wants to knock us down and, 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 and hopefully we won't get up again. But he's, the, the Bible says we have the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Now the sword of the Spirit, the Word of the Lord, is powerful. The Bible says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Sharper than any two-edged sword you might find. It's powerful. And it can divide right in between soul and spirit. This is the word, the sword that we have been given to fight. Now let's move on and I want to give you one major illustration about this. The word of the Lord. God said, he came to Isaiah chapter 55 and he said, Surely you shall call a nation you do not know, and nations who do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, nations of the earth are going to come to him because the Lord has exalted him. And then he says, seek the Lord while he may be found. You notice the caps? Seek the, seek Jehovah while he may be found. That also would stand for seek Yahashua for he may be found. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. And he will have mercy on him for, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Now, notice the terms for being 
for receiving mercy and for being pardoned? Let the wicked, what? Hold on to his wicked ways? Did you read what it says? Forsake his wicked ways. Forgiveness is conditioned upon repentance. And without repentance, you can't sue God for forgiveness. Oh, God, forgive me. I plan to do it again tomorrow. Now, that's like paying ahead of time for the sin you want to commit tomorrow, but you want forgiveness today for the ones you're going to do tomorrow. That's not what he said. He said, let the wicked forsake his way. And let the unrighteous man that has unrighteous thoughts that he's acting out, let him forsake his unrighteous thoughts. That's true, genuine repentance. Turn away from the evil, and then when you come to God, return to the Lord. He will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And then I want you to get down to this passage here and read the first. Let's read it. Here's the example. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. Another translation says empty. It won't come back without completing its purpose. But shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. When God sends His word, He means for it to be fulfilled. Yes. When God sends His word, it's to accomplish the purpose that He spoke it for. When we speak the words of God, with God's intentions driving the word of God, it will accomplish that for which it's spoken. Because it is the word of the Lord. And he said, it will not come back empty, but it will accomplish what it is sent for. And it will do what I had in mind when I spoke it. Now, to give you a little, little illustration of this, let's go to this little story. My father was G.T. Buston. I'm G.T. the second. My son Gary is G.T. the third. Uh, my father's name was Green Green Oliver. I think you can figure out maybe he's a little Irish from the name in Green. But uh, he was, it was G R E E N, Oliver, G T. So he forgot those two words most of the time, just went by G T Buston. And then when I came along, they wanted to make me a junior, but they didn't want to give me Green. They called me Gerald Thomas, so I'm G T also. And when our son came along, I wanted him to be GT, so we named him Gary Tom. So we've got three GTs running in the family. But my father, GT, was the founder of EBM Ministry and, and the World Missions that, that uh, it is uh, called the Evangelical Bible Missions. In 1948, he took the word of the Lord to a primitive, to primitive tribesmen in the Stone Age jungle of New Guinea. Now, that was 1948. Notice, at that time, New Guinea was one of the most primitive last frontier countries in the world. And cannibals in New Guinea had killed and eaten missionary James Chalmers, that's a picture of him, just 47 years before, on April 8, 1901. And it was still considered very dangerous territory when G.T. Buston arrived and went deep into the interior. Now, he wasn't there to go and look for gold or try to find the oil or try to find a way of making money. He had one purpose in going, that was to take the word of the Lord to those people who had never heard the word of the Lord. So when he made his way, he landed in Port Moresby down on the bottom. He followed a little red trail up to Lay and then flew on up to Mount Hagen. Mount Hagen was the edge of civilization. There was a government post there, a government patrol officer there, and the government had his policemen and people that tried to, were trying to subdue the wild savages and, and bring them under control. But Mount Hagen was the last age of civilization, and 
To go beyond that, you're going into no man's land where the government did not tame the people or, or, or civilize the people or brought them under law and order. My father wasn't happy to just go and stop where other people had gone. He said, I want to reach some of those people who've never heard the word of the Lord. I want to go beyond, on into the interior of where, where those people have never even seen a white man or never heard anybody from another country, never seen a Bible, never heard the name of Jesus. Those are the people I want to try to reach and take the word of the Lord to. So he went on beyond. Now, notice up here at the top of the picture, you see Mount Hagen. Well, you can't really see it, but it's in, the, it's in on the bottom side of the mountain range that you see just to the, well, looking at it, it would be to, your, to the left of Mount Hagen. But you see the, uh, that's the Mount Kuba range. The Mount Kuba range is 12,000 feet above sea level. Mount Hagen is down a little valley, and that was the, age of civilization as far as they knew it back then. One of the government patrol officers said, well, I don't want you to go in there by yourself. I'll come along to protect you. And he brought some policemen and they trekked two days following the native trails, crossing the rivers and, and up, going up and down the mountains until they finally came to this place called Papakoya, which was at that time an unreached people. They were looking at the white man for the first time. They'd never seen this strange looking thing that was coming to, towards them. And when, he, when they saw him coming, they were holding their bows and their arrows and, and their, their stone axes and their tools of warfare, waiting to see what kind, of, what kind of danger they might be in. They were afraid he would hurt them. He was afraid they would kill any him. And these two were coming together on a collision course, but one of them had the word of the Lord with him. The others had never heard the word of the Lord. The others had their own forms of paganism, their own forms of worship of ancestors. They had no word of the Lord. They, they had never heard the name of Jesus or the name Jehovah uh, or seen a Bible. They didn't know what it meant, meant to read and write. And when he made his way up to these people, he couldn't speak their language. But he said, God told him, there's one language they can understand, and that is reaching out and giving them a hug. So he walked up to him, put his arms out, and began to hug every one of them that he could reach, and they started hugging him back. And finally, he got an interpreter that could translate. And when he met with him, he said, I came to bring you the word of the Lord, the creator, the God who made all this place. He sent me with his word to tell you what he wants you to understand and know. They received him. The tribes people in this area received him and they took him down and showed him a, a, an area and they said, we'll, we'll build you a house here. And in just two or three days they had built him a native house, a house made of native materials. And then they said, okay, this is your place. We're giving this land to you so you can tell us the word of the Lord. And that began the process of reaching these people of this area, Papakoria. And the mission station that, that, that they gave to him was eventually called Paparabuk. And this was a place where he began to share the word of the Lord with the people of the interior of New Guinea. These people, remember, had never seen the outside world. They didn't know anything about God or anything about the God that we know. But many of them came to understand and believe. Here's an old man. Well, he's probably almost as old as I am, so I guess maybe he is a very young man with him, but he looks old. Uh, I guess that white beard helps to set him aside. But uh, this man, uh, his name is Namugamara. He was probably just a baby when G.T. Buston arrived there and, and met his parents for the first time. Later in 1958, my father took me to New Guinea. Ten years after he went, I went with my father as a teenager to the country of New Guinea. When I got to Parabu, this, was, this guy was a little boy at the Parabu mission station. And eventually I got to learning their language and speak, so I could speak the tribal language with them. And on one occasion, 
I had made it later. They, they built a kind of a gravel or sandy road from the top, from Mount Hagen all the way out to Powerbrook. And uh, there was a place where they had a big vine bridge. They didn't have a bridge, a, a regular bridge, so you couldn't drive a vehicle out there. You could go to the place where the bridge was, and then you'd have to go across the bridge. But I had a bicycle. Mm -hmm. And so I could ride down the hills and push up the hills, uh, get off and push it up the hill and go down the other side. And uh, this fellow was was my little friend. He and I were leaving Mount Hagen, trying to make the 20 miles out to Powerbrook. And so he, he wanted to hitch a ride with me on my bicycle. So for 20 miles, I rode him on my bicycle part of the way, because part of the way, I said, OK, if you want me to ride you down here, you can push the bike up the hills. So he pushed the bike up the hills, and uh, I got him on, and we rode down the hills. And we made a lot better time that way. We finally got in the park. So I had the honor of, when he was just a boy, riding him for 20 miles on a bicycle back to the mission station. He went to the mission schools and eventually became the governor of the Southern Highlands. And uh, I was, when I was over there in 2014, we had a good chance to visit together and uh, reminisce about some of those days. These are part, this is part of the word of the Lord penetrating into the darkness, the powerful word of God, the sword of the spirit, that penetrated into the darkness of the minds that had been held in darkness for so many years and illuminated them to the, to the knowledge of the gospel. And uh, in 1974, when New Guinea got its independence and became the nation known as Papua New Guinea, officially now, the government declared and put in the constitution that Papua New Guinea is a Christian nation. Why? Well, it wasn't just what my father and some of us had done there in the country from 1948 until 1974, but many mission groups throughout the nation had been taking the word of the Lord into the countries, into the hills and the valleys of New Guinea. And many of those people that we touched went on to become the leaders of this new nation. And they said, we want this to be a Christian nation. And wrote it and documented it. Now here's a little, here's a little clip. Here's a little clip I want you to see. And, and uh, you'll love the first two kids, the three kids singing. But uh, this is a little clip that shows just a little bit. It's a promotional EBM video that we put together a few years back. But watch it and uh, rejoice with us over the, po the power of the word of the Lord and what it has done in just one nation. Many others too, but this one here. And from the jungle were enrolled in mission schools and given a chance to learn to read and write. They were taught to see themselves as objects of God's love and encouraged to develop the potential God had vested in them. Today, as adults, they have joined in declaring the love of Jesus to others. serving God by touching their nation for Jesus, while serving as pastors, teachers, medical caregivers, business professionals, and members of national parliament. One of those sons of the jungle got his start in our mission schools and went on to become Sir Riva Korowi, Governor General of the nation of Papua New Guinea. EBM needs you. We need you to partner with us by one, becoming a serious prayer partner. Two, by going as a short-term or career missionary. Three, by becoming a generous financial partner. Four, by becoming an ambassador of goodwill. 
for EBM and by introducing us to new partners. Together, we can help others break out into joyful song. transform those bush people in Papua New Guinea can transform America again as well. We're praying for that third great awakening. America has seen two great awakenings. The first one that created the foundation for this nation to be born. The second one that preserved the nation from the evils that were coming against it. And we need the third great awakening to save this nation and to propel it out into spreading the gospel in the world like it should be, like God intended for it to do. So we're praying for that. And the same God, through the word of the Lord, is able to transform this nation as well. Those people over there today are great friends of the United States and they're very dedicated friends of Israel as well. Even though the United Nations is turning against Israel and is showing a strong bias in favor of Islam against Israel, God's word is still true, and it will not return to him for him. And in that country, EBM was instrumental in starting over 600 churches that were planted all over the nation of Papua New Guinea to touch the lives of many people, and they're still being touched today. The word of the Lord. Now, what, what do you have in your sheath? The sword of the Spirit. What is the sword of the Spirit? The word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord is strong and mighty and powerful. That's the weapon that God has given us as our offensive and defensive weapon to go against the forces of darkness and will overcome. Now, one last song, and this one is, is uh, sung by Amy Grant, and it's also a song that speaks, goes back to the, the name of the Lord that God gave to Abraham and he came to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not only, not only uh, Jehovah, he's also El Shaddai, the all-powerful God, the almighty God. Listen to this, and then we'll close in prayer. El Shaddai. Hey. 
Father, thank you for the sword that you've given us. Thank you that you've given us your word, that we can study it, we can hear it, we can ingest it deep into our souls and spirits, and then we can say it, we can speak it, we can use those words to defeat the powers of darkness around us. Help us not to be lazy soldiers, but help us to be students of your word as we study to sharpen our sword and understand what's in your word and know how to use it against the forces of evil and darkness that are on attack against us. I pray that you help each one of us not to be satisfied just to hear a message on Sunday morning, but make us students of your word. Help us to be real disciples. Help us to understand that your word is meant to be a light for us, a lamp to shine the way for our feet, and to show us the way you want us to go. Let your word be that which directs and, 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 and our choices and, and helps us to have the wisdom that we need to live the way you want us to live. Lord, let your word take root in our hearts and in our minds until it fills us until our thoughts are on your word, until when the attacks come, we've got the handy reference to pull up and speak in power your words to defeat the enemy. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us such a powerful weapon. Help us to learn how to use it properly so that we might defeat the evil around us and overcome. In the name of the Lord, our God, we pray your blessing upon us now as we go. Let your Holy Spirit take your word and apply it into our hearts. Create a hunger and a passion in our hearts to really know you and to know your word and to know how to apply and use it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor, I'm